What was Venice Beach before? When you're new to a city, you usually turn to a map. Maps give you a bird's eye view of an area, so you can get a better sense of how a location is laid out. Where are the main roads, the coast, the parks? How close do particular locations appear to be to each other? And I can get some specific information if I'm interested, like where are the landmarks that I want to check out, or the tourist traps that I want to avoid. Maps are an incredibly handy way of organizing information visually so we can understand something like the topography of a place in better context. And in the age of interactive maps, you can search, navigate, and zoom in to really learn about a place in close detail. You can live in a place most of your life and still get a thrill from seeing things in a different perspective than you do normally. But we can also learn about a place by looking at a different sort of a map. In this visual, instead of representations of waterways and roads, we're looking at everything that's text. So this is essentially everything that's been published about Venice Beach as a topic from mainstream news sources and blogs in the past year. So how do we get to a map like this? It starts with natural language processing. We use software that essentially reads everything it can find about Venice Beach while noting key events, phrases, words, and other significant entities. Then it compares every individual piece it reads to every other piece it can find. And the pieces are represented by these individual circles or nodes. And where it finds two pieces that share a lot of language in common, it draws a link between them. And the software also seeks to understand which pieces have thematic similarity, meaning that they're about the same overall topic. And these are the nodes that get clustered very closely together and have a lot of nodes linking in between them. And from there, we employ a physics engine. And the software considers each of these individual nodes and the links and the clusters. And out of these forms a map. And from here, it's really interesting to take a look at the structure of a network. Because you can look at the structure and immediately start to learn a lot about that topic. So in this case, we can actually see that this network in particular has a few distinct sort of limbs to it. Right? It looks like it has arms and legs. And that means that while clusters have a lot in common with the other clusters that are directly next to it, overall, this network is divided into a few pretty distinct topics. It's pretty stretched out. And that's very different from a lot of the networks that we end up looking at, which can end up appearing more like a hairball, where everything is fairly well interconnected. For example, here's a network that we did on the environment, where we can see that all of the language shares an awful lot in common. But that Venice Beach network, it's really more of a series of fairly distinct worlds. And so we can color those larger areas or those worlds to kind of highlight them better and really start to understand the makeup of this network about Venice Beach. And so you see these four main clusters around the periphery, startups, fashion and celebrities, arts and sports, and society. And there's a fifth cluster right in the middle there focused on food and tourism. And so you can see that food and tourism, in terms of what's being written about at Venice Beach, is really sort of the hub of this network. It's what tends to connect more of these other clusters that aren't really connecting to each other. And we can zoom in on any cluster more specifically to learn more in detail. So in this food and tourism cluster, we can see, for example, on the food side, things about vegan treats and poke bowls. And on the tourism side, we see things like weekend getaways, best beaches, a lot of lists the 10 best places to smoke weed in LA. <laughs> and from here, let's move back up into that upper left, to that area around fashion and celebrities and break it up a little bit. Maybe not surprising that there's an area dedicated to fashion and celebrities when we're dealing with LA. But Venice Beach actually really has a prominent place in fashion and is specifically noted as an influence among designers on the catwalks in Milan and within specific collections from the past year, like Montclair and Massimo Giorgetti. Venice Beach is also home to local designers like Buck Mason, and Tom's is here as well. But if there's one designer that has dominated the conversation around fashion in the past year, it's Tommy Hilfiger. 
his Tommy X GG collection with model Gigi Hadid is the sixth largest cluster in everything written about Venice Beach in the past year. He's claimed he drew inspiration from the area, and he actually forewent Fashion Week in New York this last time and actually had a star-studded fashion show here along the beach instead. And Tommy X Gigi is also what we call a bridging cluster because you can see it kind of connects these various clusters. They all go kind of through the central cluster. In this case, fashion designers, fashion shows, and celebrity sightings. They're all connected, which makes sense because that event was essentially a mix of all three of those things. And you can see it even spawned this mini Lady Gaga cluster down there at the bottom since she attended his show as well. So if Tommy and Gigi is dominating that fashion and celebrity area, we can see in the bottom left that it's Snapchat that's really overshadowing everything connected to startups in this area. In fact, Snapchat is the single largest cluster in this entire network, comprising of 12% of everything written about Venice Beach in the past year. Now, most of that was about the company's IPO and the introduction of Snapchat spectacles. But there's also another one of those mini clusters off to the right there about Miranda Kerr, a supermodel who recently married the founder of Snapchat. And you know, it's funny, I do a lot of networks on a lot of different topics. And it's only when those topics have something to do with LA that you get all of these mini celebrity islands being spawned off of the network. It's a very unique phenomenon. From there, let's move up a little bit into that central area on society. And you can see that it's connected into these four distinct clusters. So you've got one on the left there about real estate, house prices, trendy home design, that sort of a thing. In the upper right, there's a section that's profiles of people who live and or died in Venice Beach. And below that, a cluster about crime. But the cluster that connects real estate, people, and crime is this one on government and housing. And we can zoom in a bit closer into that cluster and see that it's actually split into two distinct areas. The section on the right is really more about local politics and marijuana recently becoming legal. On the left side is an area that focuses on the difficult housing situation that's been emerging in Venice. Every one of those nodes is a distinct piece. And in the software, you can actually click through those pieces and read and research. And I spent a lot of time in this area and found it extremely fascinating. For example, I learned that startups and media companies, and most notably Google, have been flocking to this area. And that the LA Times calls Venice Beach the epicenter of LA's Airbnb problem, where people looking to rent a place around here have been pushed out, and instead inventory is going to people who are in town for a few days. And the Wall Street Journal calls Venice Beach, quote, the toughest place in the United States to build new housing. And there's a lot of tension between those people who have lived in Venice Beach for a while and want to keep it exactly as it is, versus those who want to make neighborhoods more accessible to a wider variety of people who currently feel priced out. And if I actually zoom back out on the network again, we can actually see that tension in the network. If instead of coloring all of these nodes by the themes, we can color them by sentiment. And so now, every node that's colored green represents an article where the sentiment is overwhelmingly positive, or at least majority positive. And you can see that that's most of the network here. If it's yellow, it means the language is neutral. And if it's orange or red, it means that it's the majority negative. And so the first place your eye probably goes is to that crime network. Crime is very negative. That's hardly a surprise. Crime is rarely good. And that actually includes another celebrity island there at the bottom having to do with Ronda Rousey's Venice Beach House, the MMA fighter, which was recently vandalized. Above that, we can see a cluster uh, about the Bruce Willis movie, Once Upon a Time in Venice, which got brutal reviews. So that's enough, apparently, to make a cluster red as well. <laughs> but let's return back to that society area right there in the middle. And we can see a lot of yellow and red in that area. And we can also see a lot of links that are going back down to the left there toward that Snapchat area. And so if we zoom back into the Snapchat area, and specifically this one section of the cluster, we see that there actually is quite a lot of red and yellow there, which really tells us a lot about what's going on here. And you can see some of the headlines there. Snapchat, the company, has really continued aggressively expanding in Venice Beach, taking over houses and condos and restaurants and displacing tenants rather than moving to a more centralized location away from this residential area. And so that sparked a lot of protests and generated a lot of anger with residents. And in fact, I found out just last night that Snapchat is actually taking over the very building that we're sitting in right now pretty soon. 
And if we zoom back out a little bit, you might have noticed that freak show cluster earlier. Freak show is a local boardwalk show uh, that features bearded ladies and sword swallowers. And it's connected down here to Snapchat because they've recently had to shut down after several decades. And they blame Snapchat for their demise. They claim that because of soaring rents and a landlord that pushed them out of a building that they shared with the tech company. And so if you're Snapchat or you're on the city council and you look at a map like this, you can tell that you've got a pretty big problem growing, at least according to perception. But these are just stories from a particular moment in time. Venice Beach, like any place, continues to change and evolve. And just like you update maps to add new highways or buildings, you also want to continue to watch a network to see how it evolves over time. This is another look at Venice Beach, this time based on everything written by those same collection of sources between 2013 and 2014. So this is about four years ago. And you can see it looks a lot different. Here we see this much tighter central network where you kind of have all interjoined fashion and music, designers and artists. And so what that tells us is there seems to be this more heavily connected core than what we saw in 2017. Remember how it was all stretched out? And so that tells us that there was more of this community of creativity, at least in terms of how it was being written about. When you had someone writing about fashion in Venice Beach, they were probably also mentioning music. Or if they were talking about music, they were likely connecting it to designers and artists. We can also see a startup cluster again here, a little further to your right. But Snapchat is merely one third of that cluster instead of being the dominant cluster across the entire network. And there we see government again as well, but you can see it's way far from the center. And the debates back then were about Wi-Fi and making the boardwalk safer. But any talk about housing was essentially non-existent. You can also see Freak Show up there at the top. They were alive and well. They actually were the sixth largest cluster just four years ago. And they were actually the topic of a television show on AMC as well. And Justin Bieber up there at the top, back then he had his own celebrity island as well. Maps created out of language don't have to just be about a geographic location. We can also map out everything written about a topic like childhood obesity, or fake news, or man buns. <laughs> Regardless of topic, the ability to see the connections between language across many disparate written pieces allow us to form pictures about a particular topic that can give us an entirely new perspective and allow us to make more informed decisions going forward. Thank you. <laughs>